Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel session on health and climate change. My name's Rob Brecchia. I work with the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Uh, and we've got a great panel for you here today who I will introduce in just a moment. But first, obviously, welcome to all of you in the room here in Berlin, but also welcome to everyone online joining us too. Um, there's going to be a good opportunity to ask questions to our panel uh, a bit later on in the session. And that goes for all of you in the room, but also those of you online. And uh, you can feed into this session on both Twitter and Facebook. And if you put your comments on there using the hashtag HCBerlin, which you should see uh, always up on the screen, then we've got our team here monitoring uh, those platforms to feed into, into this conversation. Um, so I'd like to introduce our panel today. We've got a great range of expertise with us. In the middle, we have Clement Bagnoa. Clement is a rehabilitation specialist. He works with uh, humanity and inclusion. He has 10 years of experience in the organization. Um, his particular areas of expertise include vaccine, uh, immunization programs, neglected tropical diseases, malaria prevention, and health systems management. And prior to working with HI, he has a really considerable amount of experience working with the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso. So welcome, Clement. Uh, on the, ah, yeah. To the left of the stage, we have Carol Devine. Carol is a humanitarian advisor with MSF. Um, She's got considerable field experience around the world, uh, and also with the MSF Access Campaign, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, she, she also currently co-leads uh, an important project at MSF on climate and environmental health. So we're thrilled to have you here today, Carol. And on the right of the stage, we have Angela uh, Muriuki. Angela is a maternity, maternal and reproductive health advisor with Save the Children. Uh, and previously, she was the head of child survival for Save the Children Kenya. Um, again, extensive field experience, um, particularly across the African continent, in, in a real variety of roles as well. So welcome, Angela, to this session. <laughs> and lastly, we have one more ghost panelist. Uh, Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is joining us online from London and is going to be introducing the topic in just a moment. Um, uh, his CV is uh, fairly extensive, but just to give you a few highlights, he's held the position of both Dean and Director at um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, and he's been a, a member on a number of kind of important uh, bodies related to the topic that we're going to be discussing today, including the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which he's sat on three times, uh, as he's sat on the committee, the WHO Advisory Committee on Health Research, and also on the UK uh, DFID Research Advisory Group as well. His research interests are very applicable to what we're going to be discussing today. Um, they involve the effects of climate change on health and the health co-benefits of low carbon policies. So welcome, Andy. And I'll hand over in just a second to Andy to, to give the introductory um, uh, uh, piece to, to this session. But first, just to give you a quick background on what it is we do at the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change. Essentially, we are a international research collaboration that works to track the world's response to climate change and demonstrate what these actions or failures to act mean for our health. Our team produces an annual report in The Lancet uh, in which we monitor indicators uh, which continue to be developed and refined as we kind of progress in the project. And these indicators cover a real range of topics relating to health and climate change from the very direct health impacts, such as from heat waves, um, wildfires and climate sensitive infectious diseases um, to kind of policy issues such as the policies around adaption and mitigation um, to climate change with, a, with obviously a uh, aim to improve health. We hope that 
the work we do acts as a resource for a broad range of organizations to use, including yourselves. Um, but we also work to produce specific briefings for certain target countries, for policymakers there, to try and give our advice as to what we believe uh, needs to be done at that, those national levels. Our message is really that climate change is not just a threat, although of course it is a massive threat, but it's also a public health opportunity, which we heard alluded to in, in the last session. And that a transition to a, a path which keeps us well below two degrees C, and therefore is better for our population's health than the other potential paths, we, be we, like, we believe that that transition isn't just possible, but it's actually beginning to get underway in certain areas. And our indicators start to show signs of that. But unfortunately, also our indicators show that really not enough is being done and considerable work needs to be done to help us go down that path. And so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Andy to introduce us to the uh, topic of health and climate change. Thanks, Andy. Well, th thanks very much for the introduction. Can I just check you can hear me? Yeah, we hear you well, Andy. Good. Well, thanks so much. Um, so we live uh, in a period, really, of extraordinary change. And um, we've witnessed, since the middle of the last century or so, dramatic improvements in human health. Uh, about 25 years, on average, increase in life expectancy um, around the world. But those improvements, of course, have come at a tremendous cost. We have exploited our land surface. We have exploited fresh water resources. We have destroyed biodiversity. And we've altered the climate in achieving that level of human progress. And of course, it's also been achieved very inequitably. So in many cases, the populations that have contributed the least to the these change are the most vulnerable uh, to its effects. So what I'm going to do is to very briefly uh, summarize uh, some of the effects. I want to start off with this slide, um, which really is some is the changes in surface temperatures since the records began. And the uh, you're, you're... answer, essentially. And that is that temperature has increased by about one degree since pre-industrial times. And as you've heard, we're heading probably towards at least uh, two degrees. This slide shows you two different things. So at the bottom line is an emission scenario where we keep below two degrees, which is the target in Paris. I mean, we'd like to keep below 1.5 degrees uh, heating, but that's going to be extraordinarily difficult. But the top line is a really worrying one because that's the emissions which would take us towards four degrees on average with some uncertainty bands, so it could be much higher or a little bit lower by the end of the century. So where are we now following the Paris Agreement? Well, the Paris Agreement was obviously a great political triumph, but when we look at the emissions reductions resulting from Paris, it's a more sobering perspective because it looks as though we're currently on about 3.2 degrees if all the promises, all the commitments that were made in Paris are implemented, and of course they may not be. So that's clearly unsatisfactory, it's clearly very worrying because the effects on human health accelerate as the temperature and other climate changes um, increase. So we have a choice and we have to make that choice within the next few years because the most important greenhouse gas, which is and our atmosphere about days up in the atmosphere for a thousand years or more. That's a legacy that we're leaving uh, future generations. This slide shows us how temperatures may vary around the world. So when we talk about two degrees average, that doesn't mean the whole planet is warming at two degrees. The land warms faster than the oceans. 
and some parts of the land warm faster than other parts, as you can see from the left side of this slide. So as temperatures rise, there are also increasing risks, and they are displayed on the right-hand side of this slide. And you can see it's taken from a recent IPCC report of global warming of 1.5 degrees. And you can see that as temperatures rise to 2 degrees or beyond, then the threats to many important and indeed vital systems uh, are increased uh, by an order of magnitude sometimes. So ecosystems are threatened, coral reefs die off, the Arctic region is particularly susceptible to heating, we see increased coastal flooding and river flooding. So as the sea level rises, and that could be several meters of sea level rise, if, for example, the ice sheets melt, it could be seven plus meters of sea level rise, river flooding because of increased precipitation events. And that's accompanied by decreased crop yields and, of course, effects on human health. But there's another factor, too, and that is that climate doesn't just change in a linear way. Sometimes you can get nonlinear changes, and these could even be self-reinforcing, so it could be self-amplifying. So, for example, if methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, is released from the permafrost, then that could accelerate um, heating and potentially at least take us into a kind of positive feedback system where it then becomes difficult to halt uh, climate change. And there are many other tipping points illustrated on this slide, such as the melting of the Greenland green sheet. Uh, and then you lose the reflective albedo of the ice, and so that accelerates local warming. Disruption of the Atlantic thermohaline circulation, which transfers heat across the Atlantic. Decline of the Amazon rainforest, which could become a net source rather than a sink of carbon, and so on. So there are many of these tipping points and the probability of exceeding multiple tipping points increases as the temperature increases. So when we reach three degrees heating, for example, there's a 40 to 50 percent chance of exceeding these multiple tipping points. In the last year, the WMO has reminded us in its report about the multitude of climate risks, extreme events, and the related impact. Not all of these are necessarily due to climate change, but they're amplified by climate change. You can see, for example, that the number of undernourished people has um, increased. There's a historical decline, but that's gone up again in recent years. About 35 million people affected by floods. The oceans are becoming more acid, and it's having a lot of effects on ocean ecosystems. We know that there's increasing um, numbers of people exposed to extreme heat, and um, about uh, over 800,000 of the internal Many of these, uh, about 30%, are linked to floods and another 30% or so to droughts. And worryingly, there's an overall decrease in global oxygen at the moment percentage. But obviously, as that goes on over time, then that threatens the viability of many living systems. And of course, and the thing that concerns you a lot is, of course, many people, about 2 million people displaced by weather are climate-linked uh, disasters. So um, there's a lot to give us concern in current trends, and one of the challenges ha is how to attribute those trends to climate change itself. And there's a lot of advance now in statistical methods which allow us to attribute specific events and the deaths associated with them. So, for example, the major heat wave in, in Europe in 2003, which killed about 70,000 people, we know the risks of death in central Paris were increased by about 70% as a result of climate change. And that will get more intense, of course, um, in the future. So what are the implications for human health? Well, they're complex. I don't have time to go into detail about them. But there are a variety of mechanisms, the direct effects of rising temperatures and more extreme weather, level rise, carbon dioxide increase affecting the nutritional quality of crops. And these have impacts on human health as I say, very directly through increasing heat, through changes in natural systems, like changes in vector ecology or crop yield, and then changes in social systems, social and economic systems, driving more people back into poverty. The World Bank suggested possibly 100 million people driven back into poverty by 2030 in the absence of effective action. 
And then, of course, potential effects on forced migration, civil conflict. And, of course, it's not just physical effects, but also mental health impacts. And many of these are summarized um, on this slide. And I won't go into each of them in detail, but you can see that there's a wide range of different health outcomes, uh, ranging from these very direct to much less direct um, effects. Many of them, the vulnerability is greater in low-income settings, the kind of settings in which many of you work. And as I mentioned, in many cases, those populations have had the least contribution to make to the drivers of environmental change. It's well known, of course, that heat-related deaths increase as the heat exposure increases. But it's sometimes overlooked that um, as heat exposure increases, it becomes progressively more difficult to work in um, tropical and subtropical regions. And this is a paper we published um, <clears throat> less than a year ago, where we looked at the effects of climate change, the projections of climate change, and the effects that it would have on labor productivity as climate change increases over coming decades. And what we found was using several different climate models, we found that as uh, temperature increase goes above about two and a half degrees, about um, a billion people um, are exposed to such extreme heat in the hottest month of the summer that it, it's extremely hazardous to work. And these are people who, this is working in the shade. If you work outdoors, of course, then it's even more hazardous and that becomes you know, virtually impossible under these kind of scenarios, certainly during the daylight hours. So this is just one example of how it becomes progressively more difficult to maintain livelihoods. And this poses a direct and an indirect effect on human health. And it will affect, of course, the millions of subsistence farmers and many other laborers around, around the world. And then, of course, there's the effects on crop yield. And the top part of the slide shows you, the red area shows you where crop productivity is going to decline. Most of the work's been done on cereal crops because they're the staple crops on which the foundations of our calorie supply depend on. But we've also been increasingly doing work on fruit and vegetables. Fruit, vegetables, nuts, and seeds are also very important for health because they provide essential micronutrients and they protect against many non-communicable diseases like stroke, heart disease, some types of cancer, and so on. And these will all be threatened by climate change. There may be some increases in productivity in temperate regions, shown by the green at the top of the slide, but we don't know how long it will go on, and we don't know whether people in poorer countries will be able to afford to buy food in perhaps an increasingly competitive market conditions as climate change goes on. And you can see at the bottom, the Global Hunger Index shows you where vulnerability is high at the moment. And there's a lot of overlap between those areas that are threatened and those areas that are vulnerable at present. The best estimate we have is about half a million extra deaths, something of that order by mid-century, but it could be um, quite a lot more than that. Uh, maybe we can adapt to some degree, uh, but obviously these, these statistics are a matter of enormous concern and they only get worse in, in later centuries. So infectious diseases, that's an important health outcome, of course. And this slide just summarizes the drivers of infectious disease threat events in Europe. Of course, Europe has very strong public health systems. So in Europe, we would expect those effects to be less. To have better data in Europe. And that's why this slide is useful, because it shows us that climate and other natural environmental changes, like the land use change, are important drivers of infectious disease threats of different vector-borne diseases in Europe um, over recent years. So changes in the distribution of important disease vectors like um, Edes albopictus, for example, which is an important uh, vector for, for dengue, chikungunya, and other um, infections uh, that can be uh, <coughs> expanded. The range of those species can be expanded um, by, by climate change. We also know that climate change has important effects on mental health, and indeed um, our colleagues in psychiatry have coined this new term, solastalgia, which they define as the distress caused by environmental change. And that's when people see their familiar environment disappearing around them and being transformed into a completely different environment. It's been documented in Australian farmers tackling, uh, trying to address drought. It's been documented also in people living in the Arctic that have seen their communities displaced by melting ice and so on. 
And we also know that um, after floods, major floods, many studies have shown an increase in common mental disorders, depression, and anxiety for considerable periods after floods. And that's probably related to a loss of familiar possessions, increase um, in, in poverty, and sometimes displacement. And there's also evidence uh, shown on the right side of this slide that temperature changes itself, themselves may actually increase suicide rates. It's data from the US and, and Mexico, but there's also data from India, for example, on, on farmers, increased suicide rates in farmers. There may be different mechanisms for the increase in, in suicide rates. And then the effects, um, this is one taken from some work my colleagues uh, have been doing in, in Bangladesh, uh, Pauline Shilby, Kaneri Khan, and others. And they've been looking at the effects of saltwater intrusion into freshwater aquifers in coastal Bangladesh. Many coastal pond on local freshwater sources, as they do in coastal Bangladesh. And as the sea level rises, often due to climate change in combination with other local changes like damming of rivers and shrimp farms and so on, then you get increasing ingress of salty seawater into the freshwater. And they've shown that that increases blood pressure, increases hypertension in pregnancy and preeclampsia, and the blood pressure risk uh, actually varies as the sodium level in the water varies throughout the year, depending whether it's the dry season or the rainy season. So there's compelling evidence that it is indeed linked to drinking water, the sodium level in drinking water. So that's um, an area, an issue, which we didn't predict some years ago, but is now becoming increasingly um, apparent. And then finally, <coughs> these complex uh, changes due to socioeconomic change. And this paper is taken from Science uh, a year or so back. And this study was not done by us, but by others, Missyrian and Schlenker. And what they did was to look at the relationship between temperature in the growing season of those countries from which the majority of EU asylum applications come from. And they documented a close relationship between temperature in the growing season and EU asylum. They proposed to, which accelerated um, some of the economic uh, challenges in these countries. And what they showed, projecting these figures forward, was that there's going to be a very major increase, percentage increase, in asylum applications under climate change. And all the, although the actual numbers are subject to some uncertainty, they could be very, very large indeed. And the probability of some increase is extremely high. So it's just one study illustrating the potential challenges of population movement as a result of climate change. And there are likely to be many other um, factors as well involved in climate change uh, in relation to climate and other environmental uh, changes. So we have to adapt to climate change, um, and uh, you'll be talking quite a lot about some of those adaptation strategies over the next few days. And um, clearly we need to put in place early warning disease, early warning systems, heat wave early warning systems, flood early warning systems. We need to be creating much more resilient health systems. There's a lot that can be done to improve adaptation to climate change, but there are limits. There are physical limits, like low-lying islands and coastal regions. There are behavioral limits, like people not wanting to leave their familiar environment. And of course, there are technological limits, even in high-income countries. Uh, flood defenses need to be uh, re-engineered, and that's often very costly. And one can question how possible it will be to adapt to many meters of sea level rise, which could plausibly occur um, over coming um, decades or centuries anyway. Uh, so there are many, many challenges to adaptation. And that means we have to act really now to cut emissions. And this slide just emphasizes the need for urgent decarbonization. If you focus on that second set of rings, the two degrees centigrade set of uh, <clears throat> semicircles or uh, segments, you can see that we have for a 50% probability of keeping below 2 degrees centigrade beyond pre-industrial temperatures, we have less than 30 years of... Andy, you're breaking up us on, on this last point. Um, are you there? Can we... 
Can we hear from you just again? Can you, can you talk to us? I think we've lost him. Andy? And the uh, benefits of an to Andy. the introduction, the benefits are very major because they will result in reduced um, air pollution from zero carbon energy, from improved health, from more sustainable um, diets with more plant-based foods and less animal-based foods, and improved transport systems with increased active travel and low carbon travel. So if we add all those together, there's the potential to save many millions of deaths through low carbon or zero carbon development, and also reduce the risks of climate change in the future. So I could speak for a lot longer, but I'll stop there and um, hand back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, great introduction, Andy. Uh, we, we lost you once or twice just briefly, but I think we, we very much took on board all your points there. Um, just, I know you need to sign off, but just very quickly before you do, I, I think you come with quite a different perspective on this topic from probably most of the people in this room, who the majority of whom work with the humanitarian uh, sector. Um, with your academic and policy perspective, what do you think are the most valuable ways in which the humanitarian community can engage in, in this topic? So I think there are three broad areas where we would really benefit, I think, from closer engagement with the humanitarian community. The first of these is on the assessment attributing uh, changes in human health to climate change itself, particularly in relation to specific emergencies, specific events, and also in relation to underlying trends in the health effects of climate change. So that would include floods, droughts, heat waves, the kind of issues that I've outlined in my presentation. So working together to improve the attribution, our understanding of the attribution of uh, outcomes to climate change will be a very important goal, I think, that we could achieve collaboratively. The second is by developing more effective strategies for adaptation and resilience. And I alluded to some of those in my presentation, but early warning systems, more resilient health systems, uh, more resilient agricultural and food systems, which would allow us to sustain food production in the face of environmental climate shocks. Currently, there is a discontinuity often between agricultural research and public health and nutrition research. And I th think working with the humanitarian community we can develop more effective strategies which sustain human health and nutrition in the face of some of these challenges. And the third area, I think, is the humanitarian community is a very powerful voice for change. And so if the humanitarian community is saying very clearly and loudly that we need rapid decarbonisation, that is the only way we can really offer the prospects of reducing some of these effects, and by the way, there are the, these major benefits for human health that I mentioned briefly at the end of my talk, the reduced air pollution, uh, improved uh, transport systems, and healthy and sustainable food systems. And if we can be um, t making that case with a single voice and reinforcing the messages that each other are putting forward, I think that will be immensely influential. So I think uh, there's a great deal to be said by much closer working relationships, and I welcome the opportunity to have that dialogue and interaction with you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. OK. Now, next I want to ask Angela. Um, your experience with Save the Children has brought you really up close to a lot of the effects of that climate change has on the health of women and children, not just the direct effects, um, but as Andy alluded to, there's a lot of indirect effects as well, and I believe that you've kind of got experience looking at these. Would you be able to, to share this with us? Yeah, thank you for um, the question. And uh, I'm hoping to be able to bring the perspective of the women and children who are living at the forefront of um, climate change. And as you all know, there's a drought that's happening in the Horn of Africa. And what's interesting is that this is happening three years after the previous drought in the Horn of Africa. 
and these ones used to come every 10 years. So something has changed. We've had two major droughts in the last eight years. There was another one five years before the previous one. And so for we who work um, with women and children in the, in the Horn, we're beginning to see this effects, not just the direct effects, but what's happening to, to these women. So for instance, we know um, the role that women play in um, caring for small animals and also in, in seeking <coughs> water and um, firewood for their households. And what's happening is that we're having women have to travel farther and farther away to look for pasture and to look for water. And the distances means women are exposed to, to risks to themselves, so risks to their safety. But also imagine if you're pregnant and you have to travel those long distances to seek water, to seek pasture. So increase in pregnancy, pregnancy loss because of um, some of these factors. It's very difficult to maintain exclusive breastfeeding when you're spending the entire day looking for water or pasture. So then they're leaving their kids behind um, and exposing them to the risk of ac acute uh, malnutrition, not just um, for the, the environmental factors that my colleague will talk about, but the inability to be able to take care of their own kids. And then these are areas where th that have the poorest infrastructure, I mean the poorest health infrastructure. So the farther and farther away you're moving, the farther you are from the limited health services that are available in the area. So then there's a difficulty in access. So if you're pregnant, you're going to deliver at, you're highly likely to deliver at home, increased risk of death. If you are, if you have vaccine, children of vaccine age, um, it's very hard to take them to and from the facility to get vaccination. So again, an increase in the risk of outbreaks. Um, we're also seeing maladaptive coping mechanisms. So in a lot of these communities, what's happening is girls get married early because when a girl gets married, then um, they get livestock as um, exchange for dairy. So the girls are being sacrificed to save the entire family. And we all know the effects of early marriage on, on girls um, in terms of the, um, the future effects of early childbearing for girls. So that's a maladaptive practice they're seeing. Early on, somebody talked about population. And what's happening is once, because of the recurrent droughts, so you have families who are being wiped out, and the coping mechanism is to have more children because we know the effect, the, the importance of children in these communities, um, not just as a sign of wealth, but also communities that are more um, agro-pastoral or pastoral tend to, kids have a very important role in care for animals within the family. So it's, it's, it's replenishing your labor force, for lack of a better word. So it's very difficult then to talk about um, pl uh, planning your family or um, the family size when somebody is thinking about survival after their entire family has been wiped out. Uh, we are also seeing social bonds breaking. So there's a, there's a lot of kingship care with these communities where if, say, one family is seeking water or um, firewood, Somebody else is left behind to take care of the younger kids. But now, with increasing um, recurrent droughts, then it's every man for himself. So suddenly, it's I, my fa I need to take care of my family and improve the survival of my family. So if, all, if most of the older women um, and are out looking for water, looking for pasture, who's taking care of the younger kids? So younger kids are left to themselves in the household. And... Um, with no proper care of children, so there are lots of other issues that could happen, including actual harm to the children. Then there's increased conflict because of uh, the lack of pasture. And um, two weeks ago, there was fighting in bet between two, two communities in the northeast of Kenya. And there were, so there are there's a family that got attacked, and the, the women and children were found in the house, and they were wiped out because of re retaliation attacks as a result of cattle raiding, and then um, the most vulnerable are, of course, women and children. So we're seeing then direct death and injury as a result of um, the, e the effects of the recurrent drought. And now the rains have come, and the rains have come, um, the amount of rain is higher than was expected. So now the issue is flooding. So there are, ma there are massive floods in several areas um, where there's, there are reports of children who've been carried away by the, by the storms. 
And now with the floods comes the issue of waterborne diseases, injuries as a result of flooding. So then, um, and then there was um, the statement that um, Andy Coyne mentioned earlier around solastalgia. When we were having these conversations, it, I, I actually didn't know it was called solastalgia because you're having conversations with people who are telling you it never used to be like this. I remember when we would wait a couple more years and then we'd know after this, then we're expecting a, a, a drought to happen and we'd be prepared for it. But now it's happening too fast and we don't know what to do. So you can see the nostalgia and the stress of remember, especially from the older women and the older men talking about it never used to be like this. And finally, I thought I'd wrap up by talking about how we who provide health services can do better, um, can adapt our way of providing services to what we are seeing um, um, in terms of um, cl the climate ch changing. So one thing is um, our ability to expand and contract in response to um, what we are seeing. I, um, I, I like to say I am a retired humanitarian. Now I work purely in development. And we development people tend to say once we see an outbreak, we're waiting for the humanitarian guys to come and fix it and then give us um, the system back when you're done. But th this is happening too frequently for us to work separately. So it's important to build the health system's capacity to expand and contract in response to the, the recurrent shocks that we're seeing. Um, earlier, earlier in the morning session, somebody talked about the Horn of Africa and the fact that we responded to a measles crisis. And then, so a measles outbreak is easily, is, it's, it's the a sign of the health system's inability to provide routine immunization. So once we are responding to a, a, a measles crisis, then we should be thinking about beyond the measles crisis. So what are we doing to build the system's ability to provide routine services and then expand to respond to a measles outbreak? So the, the, the importance of thinking through the, the, the nexus approach, so the development, humanitarian development, because unfortunately the system itself doesn't know development people and humanitarian people, it's serving one community. The other thing is around, and it's been said multiple times, that the need to build data systems that not only just um, are early warning systems, but systems that allow us to do to connect the dots, because attribution has been a major issue within um, the health sector around, is this really being caused by climate change? So ability to build data systems that allow us to make the links. And the importance of the One Health approach. In this community's priority is livestock. In the, north, in the northeast of Kenya at the moment, there's a, an outbreak of something with the animals. And so if, if you're not focusing on what's important to them, then it's very difficult to get them to seek health services. So the importance of using a One Health approach within the health system. Thank you, Angela. I think um, some of the examples you've given there really demonstrate practically what we mean when we talk about climate change being a threat multiplier and how there's all these complex interrelated relationships between these issues. Now, Clement, a, another topic which has a complex relationship with climate change is uh, is disability. Would you be able to give us an overview of what your work with Humanity Inclusion and Inclusion uh, has shown you about this? Um, have we got Clement's slides? So for of, I will just say before, uh, sorry for my English, I am French speaking man, I come from West Africa, so you will be a uh, worry for me. What I want to talk about is the link between uh, disability and uh, climate change before. Uh, I want to talk about malnutrition. We know that in our areas in West Africa, we have a we, our people are living in a uh, insecure area with uh, climate change. We have also the drought make the season, uh, the rainy season hazard, and this conduces to a food uh, deficiency. So food insecurity in West Africa is 
a most problem for people. And we know that children under five are most uh, exposed to this malnutrition because of lack of nutrients and also because of the fact that the climate change which increased the rate of several disease and disease is also the cause of malnutrition for the children under five. So a, this acute rate of malnutrition will lead to impairment in the children under five. And this disability will have consequences in the access for the service, social service and health service in case uh, if there are a lot of people with disability like the children under five, uh, their parents not have the possibility to access to health service and several times they are not encouraged to bring them to the uh, hospital because they say it's not uh, available and the people will die, the children will die. So what is very difficult is that on the hand we can say that malnutrition is caused of deficiency of food and on the other end we can see that disease is also the bed of malnutrition. How to do? Disabled people are a lot of problems to access to the services. They are at risk because they are impaired and they cannot access to the services like our person with a disability. And the recommendation we have to say it is that in this case, the more thing to do in case of catastrophe, uh, natural catastrophe like Typhoon and uh, like uh, drought, we have several programs of food assistance, of water and sanitation, but what about the access for the people with disability? And in this case, we think that all humanitarian can address the problem of a person with disability in order to make them access to the program, the action they are doing in the areas. And this is my point of view, but what I want to say in fact is that uh, food insecurity is certainly due to climate change because of drought, and food insecurity with lead to malnutrition, and if there are equite malnutrition and for children under five, there will be long-term impairment, and this impairment can be a source of non-access to the other uh, services, like uh, health services, like education, and other services. So what uh, the community must do is that in all our action, we must take care to mainstream disability in all our action in order to address uh, their access to uh, the services. Their equal access mean to identify them, to address how to let them have the uh, assistance we have in the area, and also to be able uh, to come with them or to let them access to uh, the service which is uh, available on the areas of our intervention. Other thing is that we must monitor negative impact on and change on disability. We said that uh, the temperature increase may be a source of several disease, and we know that certain disease, chronic disease, will lead to impairment, to disability. So we must uh, have attention for this in relatives of the climate change. Also for health services, we have to adapt then of the need of disabled people. Even if uh, blended people, uh, hearing disabled people and psychomotor people, when they come to health services, they have difficult to access because in front of them, workers are not uh, prepared to uh, receive them. So in the health services, we have to mainstream, we have to build the capacity of health workers to receive uh, disabled people. 
And then we have also generally capacity building for the services, human resource, to have accessibility to the services, and so. So we have to cut the barriers for their access to social service. And the main thing we do, like uh, humanitarian inclusion do in several uh, countries, is that we can also help the other NGOs to address the question of disabled people in order to limit uh, the circular of malnutrition, in order to uh, be, uh, I know, to be, uh, att pay attention for disabled people, we have the way to do this. We have tools to uh, address the impairment and also tools to identify, monitor, and make them access to the services. So uh, if needed, we can discuss this after the session. But what I want to say is that malnutrition have a link with climate change and several children with acute malnutrition will be with a long-term disability and disability will be a source of risk for the people to access to uh, equal service, a health service because, thank you. Thank you very much, Clement. Merci. Thanks, that, that was a great insight into perhaps an area which we don't immediately think about when we're talking about climate change and health, so thank you for your insights there. Um, now, Carol, uh, this year it seems that across the MSF movement there's been a significant kind of change in the way the organization is looking at climate change. Would you be able to give us an overview um, and expand upon what Caroline talked about this morning? Yes, can I go up to the podium? You absolutely can go up to the podium. <laughs> Whoops. I don't know what's happening. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much, Rob. And uh, I want to thank Angela and uh, Clement and also Andy. And I think we are really urged to, you know, really strongly put on our climate change lens. But in that, we have to also have the gender and the uh, disability lens. And I know in uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, we have a project where we're looking also at um, disability and inclusion, and certainly um, women and girls. We see so much in our programs that um, we must, uh, when we think about even people fleeing, who people who are forced to, to flee, what about people who are forced to remain or remain in the home? So thank you for that. And for uh, Jennifer and Caroline and Andy for really setting the stage to talk about um, these two days about uh, what are the threats and what are the opportunities for us together? So I'm going to, uh, I'm speaking, but I'm also bringing with many colleagues who in MSF and outside of MSF who've helped us think about this um, question. It's, it's, it's new and it's old. In MSF, when I started thinking about environmental degradation was in uh, 2000 when we had a program in the RLC. And we know the RLC was drying up extremely quickly um, because of the cotton industry and irrigation. And you know, back then, MSF uh, was responding to TB, to um, sexual gender-based violence, to social issues that happened because of this extreme change in the environment. And so we're putting on our climate change lens more consciously now, but we can also say that um, this is something that we've been responding to. And I think these next two days will help us already think a lot more about how to collaborate for this question of attribution science, but what we can also comfortably um, say now that is important to um, help center health in uh, political decision making. So in MSF, this picture is actually on the border of um, uh, Mexico near Guatemala where the teams there said, you know, help us put on this climate change lens. We're already responding to people who are um, suffering uh, and surviving in the largest migration route in the world and plus other health and exclusion issues. Uh, so when we started to uh, a couple years ago, just think about how are we going to talk about, about climate change more consciously? And we thought about, and others have talking today about adaptation, how are we thinking about our operations to be um, ready to respond and to look for the gaps um, and the people who are being excluded? How are we going to be um, 
you know, really responsive. Uh, who do we need to collaborate with so we can do that? And what changes do we need to make? So the question of the day is how, how are we going to advocate? And as you know, Doctors Without Borders, we do um, medical response based on need, but we also have this um, uh, desire and commitment um, to public or privately to do témoignage, to witness, to say what we experience. And we're hearing from Jennifer and others um, how the humanitarians, those of us working um, and um, seeing firsthand the impacts, to share that is incredibly valuable. And then, of course, we also have talked about a little bit already about our own environmental footprint. With what legitimacy can we speak about, you know, call for action, at the same time know that the healthcare sector has an enormous footprint. A really big study came out recently. And the humanitarian sector also has, has a footprint. But how are we going to um, mitigate it and still do the work that we know is important? And someone mentioned earlier also the kind of perverse effects of some actions, but, you know, not stand still. Uh, so where does MSF work? We're now in over 70 countries. Um, and if you compare the map, and Caroline talked a bit about, you know, mapping. So we are where the problems are. And where we are not, we need to think about what is the criteria for going there. Um, and certainly, uh, being in many of these countries, we also have a global workforce of 42,000 people. And you know, their voices are really important, too, because it becomes a duty of care issue when we have colleagues who say, you know, I prefer not to take my family and go and work in India because the pollution is so extreme, or I'm really worried about zero water day in South Africa. So we're hearing about this on a daily basis, and you know, we really are um, um, thinking about how we work forward. So when these are really Lancet indicators, but so when we have this, this lens on, uh, what, what are we thinking about in our operations? We're going to keep doing what we do, and that's going to be important for all humanitarians and in the development world to keep responding based on need and looking for gaps and urging governments to take their responsibility. But we are now thinking of water and food security in a way that we know it's going to be exponential, the needs, malnutrition, um, extreme weather events, and climate-sensitive diseases, and, of course, um, migration. I'm not going to spend long on that, but just to say that you know, we're thinking of these pieces already for many years, and now we're thinking of it, now will these issues be exacerbated? How are they interconnected? How can we help connect dots? Uh, how can we think outside of the box? I love these slides from Ed Hawkins, the um, warming stripes. And I recently returned from Bangladesh, uh, where the team there also said, come and help us think about, we know that it's a climate hotspot. We know that um, there's deep concern and also amazing action to build cyclone shelters, to be thinking about extreme weather events, but also urbanization, because as we heard earlier, you know, and as we know, it's cities where we're going to go. And so this is um, 150 years of warming in Bangladesh. It just reminds us, you know, storytelling is important, Witnessing is important, but also thinking of new ways to share um, what people are experiencing. And I was interested to find this slide about how some of these warming stripes. So this is how Germany's um, warming, uh, and you know Canada is also one of the fastest warming places on Earth. So I mean, it just so what, what is the human face of this warming? And that's what we humanitarians can can share. Uh, in Bangladesh, the two things that came up again and again. So when we think about patterns, Andy talked about patterns. Uh, this is um, in Dhaka, where we know so many people are moving. And MSF's work in Dhaka, we also work um, on the border with Myanmar, with the many um, refugees um, in incredible duress coming from uh, Myanmar, uh, Rohingya refugees. But this project in Dhaka, uh, what's interesting and challenging and an opportunity for us is to think about how are we going to work in um, urban situations where so many people are? How do we reach um, um, people in, uh, who are disabled? How do we reach the children left uh, at home? But So a challenge that MSF, MSF had, because we're here to talk frankly and speak about challenges, was so we're working on an occupational health project. So factories, you know, here's the perfect imperfect storm for um, abuse and, and um, exclusion is people who are poor, they've just migrated to the city, they need jobs, so they start working in factories. So MSF did an, is doing an occupational health project. So the lighting becomes better, the um, conditions become better, and that's really important, and we're working with others. Um, but how can we ignore that the water 
is terrible that people then go home to, and an increase in diarrheal disease is amongst the workers and the, the child workers. So these many, many conundrums. Um, and what is the climate change lens on that? Well, when you have uncertain um, weather, when you have torrential rains, when you have you know, environmental health concerns and incredible pollution. So this is, this is a challenge for us, but it's also an opportunity because we're going to be seeing more urban settings and we're going to be working in them. So let's, let's get a grip on um, how, how we want to work in these settings. And um, again, it was mentioned earlier, what, what does MSF do and what can others do? So the, the problem of plastic pollution we know is enormous. We don't have to do it all, but how can we, how can we collaborate? Um, this is um, the amazing um, Dr. Saiful Islam, who I was going around Dhaka and speaking to our colleagues in MSF, but also in the government, in NGOs. And I'm going to tell you another thing that came up again and again and again, and it was dengue. And I know there's been great, you know, we're not climate scientists, but there's been great research on dengue and climate change, and we're not doing that research. But what we are doing is saying, um, Dr. Seifel was saying that you know, MSF is seeing dengue in uh, the Rohingya refugee population in the south of the country, but also in Dhaka, in the urban population. And every meeting we went to in Dhaka, we didn't even have to raise it. We said, when you think about climate change and health impacts, what do you think about? Dengue, dengue, dengue. And then interestingly, when I was in um, Mexico recently um, on the border with many people coming from the northern Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and um, El Salvador, there was a huge dengue epidemic that MSF was responding to. And I could see the, and I could hear the parallels of people are getting sicker faster. So this is something we, we need to chase these patterns. Um, and why? Not, you know, not necessarily to, to do advocacy immediately, but it's so that we can respond better, so that we can be ready, and so um, others who work more on prevention can also do their work. Um, you know, just the numbers have gone up, and it's very noticeable, and it's on everyone's mind. Um, so here, um, I also, the team in Mexico said, yes, please come and um, talk to us about our programs. I mean, this is another climate hotspot, Bangladesh, but so too is Central America. And this young man um, is from Honduras, and he's going to make the extremely dangerous route. Now, this we can talk about um, um, the extreme policies of um, criminalization and um, containment of people and, you know, Climate, we, we know the numbers can be shocking and actually can be misused, but what was important about this visit was MSF knows clearly that violence is a huge factor. Violence is a huge factor in so many other places, why people are moving. But we wanted to go behind that. We'd already done a survey about you know, the half people that experience violence along the route, not only in their co country of origin, but this is what also people were saying. And we met, like this train I had heard about, La Bestia, and people lose their limb. It's mostly men and young men who try to go north and then end up coming back and forth and back and forth. So you can imagine the, the health, but also the mental health impact of that on, you know, what is my future? But what we heard was, why are people leaving? So we certainly heard violence. And people didn't say directly, I left it because of climate change. But they said, my crops have failed. There's only water for tourism. And I think those anecdotes and those stories can, can help when we share them too. And for, uh, for us, it's to understand who are we helping and what are, they, what are their needs and who may be coming. But certainly, we met so many agricultural workers who said, um, our children have no food. Um, I'll, I'll just jump quickly to two um, anecdotes uh, or stories from colleagues who are working in climate impacted regions as well. And this was an anonymous blog by an MSF nurse in Mozambique, and she lost her husband in the recent flood. And you know, we know, you know, not everyone has the language. I think also in MSF, what we're, we're learning together is what's our narrative? What, what language do we speak together? But certainly, what we can do is share the immediate impacts that people are already having. This colleague lost her, her husband in the recent massive. Um, flooding in Mozambique and also Malawi. And um, she also said that you know, she's never seen anything like this before. And we're hearing this a lot from um, MSF colleagues who are from um, these climate impacted regions, um, but also this resolve. Uh, and I think you know, the point about resilience, um, you know, we, we owe it to our, our colleagues too to um, better understand uh, what's to come. And our colleague um, uh, Chibu, he uh, we asked him recently too, but what is he seeing in West Africa? And you know, he's seeing 
children who are wealthier and he's seeing children who are poorer with malnutrition. And Clement mentioned malnutrition. But just to say that we're still not sure what is the exact cause. Like in Mexico, no one said, I fled exactly because of this. It's multifactorial. But um, you know, what we can say is we're just seeing never declining malaria. And I think that's where we can work with climate scientists and share our data quite simply. And we asked him, with this new climate change lens, do we do, do, are we changing? And he said, um, we don't have to become less medical, just more humanitarian. And I think that's a message for, for all of us and for collaborating together. I'm almost at the end. Footprint. OK, so we said in MSF, you know, to, to feel we can speak with legitimacy, we have to understand the connections better, but also own that we are surely working in areas where climate change is impacting health and humanitarian crises. But what about our own footprint? And Caroline mentioned, you know, this idea of getting a baseline. So what we did was we said, let's do it. And my colleagues, Maria Guevara and Francois Delfos, are here. And we did this transformational investment capacity, MSF's innovation fund, to say, OK, let's get a quick idea about what our major impacts are. And this is about collaboration. I'm so grateful to Catherine Vad, who's here from ICRC. I'm so grateful to um, uh, Green and Global Healthy Hospitals. And um, with um, Marie and Francois, we spoke to others in ICRC and other organizations about how do you reduce your footprint. We also understand within MSF, people are doing so much already, but how do we scale it? There are environmental health projects, there are solar projects. Anyway, the big outcome we had, which we could have guessed beforehand, was air transport. But we did, um, we, we looked quickly at Canada, Geneva, Kenya, Mexico, and Honduras. And we looked largely at our carbon, but a little bit at waste. And our procurement, that came up earlier too, um, air freight, air freight, air freight. It doesn't mean we don't do a massive lift for Ebola, but um, how can we change it when we don't need it, um, when we can send it by sea, when it's less of emergency? So we're, we're, you know, we got a good sense of our, our, our footprint, and also we're not going to totally stop to fly, but already our behaviors are changing. We found we had 400 flights between Toronto and Montreal. And we're changing that. We just didn't know. And it wasn't out of malice, like, hey, let's go to Montreal. But now we're, you know, we're going less. We're taking the train. We're asking these questions. Nora can tell you I really deliberated about coming and my 3.89 um, footprint to get here. OK, so two last slides. Um, the next step is looking at our supply chain and looking at that holistically. I think that's going to be really important. And it's going to be hard. Um, and we know ICRC has done it and got you know, not a surprise, but I think learned about um, the food part of it, the palm oil in the food. Anyway, so we're going to do this, and we're going to um, have to cooperate greatly within our organization, and we want to learn from others to, um, to uh, you know, become more climate smart. We have, we have no choice. We have to do no harm. We have our Hippocratic Oath and our ethics, and also solar prices have gone down. Can that money be used for other things? Last slide. I'm sorry. Um, let's, let's keep responding. Let's keep doing what we do, but adapt our operations. Um, we know already we want to do more epidemiological and meteorological surveillance and have a project on that. What kind of tools for analysis and adapting and choices? Because we're going to have to make choices because the, it's becoming a greater uh, issue. Um, our job as humanitarians, we can humanize. We can amplify voices of people most affected, which our colleagues did today. People-centered policy. I don't think I need to say much more about that if we think about migration. Um, and uh, at the same time, mitigate our own footprint. The humanitarian impact maybe isn't huge, but we, 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 must, we must join in if we're going to call for it at uh, government and industry level. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol. That's a great overview. Um, I, I did have a, a few questions for the panel, but I'm quite keen to open up to the audience. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, and it would be great to hear hear from some of you, and um, I'm, hopefully there'll be overlap with what I was going to ask. So uh, do we have any questions? I see a hand going up um, just down here at the front. We've got, we've got some, a couple of microphones around the room. Um, and is there anyone else who's got a question I can kind of have lined up? Over here. Uh, can we get that microphone on, please? No? Ah, ah. There we go. I, I was really happy to see the line from the nurse, because actually I worked with her in Mozambique. Mm -hmm. 
and I wrote her story. So it's amazing to see it in a slide like that. And it's exactly as you said about amplifying voices. However, I do, I do have a question. I have an issue with the slide from Andy where he shows the temperature rise and then the rise in migration to the EU. My question would be, how can we avoid to greenwash issues in the sense that we have this highly complex, which is not a crisis, by the way, we have this highly complex situation of migration, which is multifactorial, and it's a political issue in the end, and then we turn it into a very aesthetic, pleasing slide where you see temperatures and migration, and there is this direct correlation, and we, we can remove, it can be used, I mean, to remove all the other complexities around migration and the other complexities around dengue in Brazil or in Bangladesh, which are related to how people live, consume, discrimination, gender issues, etc. So my question to the panel would be that. How can we avoid to greenwash issues or to be instrumentalized? Thank you. The can we get the microphone over here and maybe the panel could uh, respond to I do not have an answer to your question on migration and how, but I would like to respond to that from um, the thing I've been struggling with around attribution because it's, it's all, almost similar in the sense that they're very nice graphs that, that um, you look at and it tells you things. But then, so I'm a doctor and um, scientist, and the issue around um, looking at the causal pathway I have struggled with for a long time, and how I have come um, to navigate that conflict is more around amplifying voices. Because what's getting lost in all the shiny discussions and in all the very contentious discussions is the people who are living this experience. I was talking to somebody who works in the Pacific region and there were the, the issues around, um, I think it might be one of the islands that has gone underwater and the issue of um, who climate refugees belong to and the heated de debate that's happening in Australia and New Zealand around who climate refugees belong to. But then we forget the people who are experiencing this. Um, and I think, and I believe our role as um, humanitarians and retired humanitarians like myself is to tell these stories because the stories are getting lost in the really contentious discussions that are going on around attribution, around chicken and egg, around is this causing this, around let, if we can keep to make sure that these stories keep being told, then we do our part. Uh, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> it's a great question, and also thank you for writing for that blog um, or helping. Uh, it's it's really something we talked about a couple days ago too. Uh, there's the possibility of being yeah instrumentalized, and we've actually seen it in Mexico when we talk about how poorly people are treated at the border. Um, these kind of graphs, you know, science really does matter, but of course there's more behind it. And I think my my colleague um, Patricia Schwerdl, who's here and Lynn Bjorklund Beliveau, who helped us you know, think in MSF more about how we're gonna talk about migration. The numbers are varied, and also it, it causes fear. It, we, it can be used against us, rather than the humanizing aspect, the, the demand that you know, policies that exist should be respected. And I think it's, it's a matter of not, not being quiet about it, but also bringing up those nuances and uh, you know, we're seeing more and more containment policies, and that's, you know, people want to live at home. They don't want to leave. And I think the more we, you know, not only tell stories, but even show data about, you know, why are people leaving? I think that that can help too, um, because you have this complete contradiction of denial of what's happening, and then, you know, the US planting tons of trees in these countries. Um, without saying why they're doing it. And so I think really our job is to like call for people-centered policies and to humanize the stories and call for like dignity and safe passage. Thank you. And, and just, just to echo the panelists, um, some of my work at Lancer Countdown has been looking at this link between migration and climate change, and it's such a complicated topic. It's also adaptation, I meant to add.
Um, and I think we, we, we are about to release our latest um, uh, report uh, later this, in the next, before the end of the year. And we've actually removed our indicator relating to migration because we're trying to work to make it more accurate. I mean, previously, um, we were able to say that climate change definitely caused maybe a few thousand people to, so far um, to be displaced, but that perhaps up to a billion people were at risk. And uh, that's perhaps not a very useful range, a few thousand to a billion. Um, and can be used, um, you know, depending on your political um, perspective or ideology, can be used to suit your, your agenda. So you're absolutely right to be concerned about some of these you know, very sensitive issues. And that's where I think the, there's room for collaboration between the scientific and humanitarian communities. And, and we can work together to try and make sure that we're doing this, this, this right. Do we have another question over here? Do you hear me? Do you yeah. hear me? Um, actually, my question uh, is based more on the what uh, Ms. Devine said. She kind of made a difference between an urban and a rural setting. And um, I'm, I would be really interested in going a little bit deeper about the kind of humanitarian intervention that is needed in uh, these two different situations. In particular, in the first two speeches, we heard a lot about common situations in the African continent. But I was wondering if you could go a little bit more in detail about uh, what problems affect what areas the most. Like, for example, um, maternity or uh, the problems linked to malnutrition and disabilities. Uh, are we talking about a generalized situation, or would you say that uh, we need to look at different uh, things in a city and different elements in other environments? Because I think like the continent's quite big, so we can't quite much generalize. Thank so, you. So a, a question around how do we tailor our responses to um, to specific contexts, and perhaps I could add, you know, given the multitude of impacts that. Uh, climate change is, can have on health, how do we prioritize those? And if, if, if there's anyone who, uh, else who's got a question, please just kind of catch my eye and I'll, um, I'll we'll get the microphone to you for the next one. Thank you. That, that's a great question. And I don't have time to go into too much detail, but maybe give two contrasting examples. I mean, we're still going to be dealing with and, and working with and applying the same kind of you know, priority on, on helping people in rural settings. But if I think about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, being in a, a refugee camp um, on the border of Kenya and South Sudan, you know, you can find a way, and you have to be really careful to find a way about where are people who are left behind, um, how, how to reach people. But then being in Dhaka and being in Kamrangichar, this urban slum, which is now considered less of a slum because now there's a new economic area near the airport, how do you find people? Like, I think that's going to be a challenge for us humanitarians about um, what, what needs are the same, but what needs are different. And um, I think it's, it's much more challenging. We're finding at least even in, um, you know, in Yemen or Syria, in cities versus in a, in a refugee camp, how do, we, how do we really make sure we're helping people who, who need it? So that's a very simplified answer, but um, we, we still want to help Mo people most in need, but we need to be thinking about cities and access um, to people and um, supply chain, like all of these issues together, we need to think about how to be reaching people and therefore working with a lot of um, people from the country who speak the language, thinking about the anthropological aspect of like, you know, where are people going and the connections, that's where working with communities is going to be so important too. And just to add to your second question around um, how do we tell what effects, um, what, what, what issues affect people depending on different areas. So at the moment, we, we don't have the kind of data that tells us if you're living in, say, a coastal area, this is one, two, three things that you should expect. And so the issue around building data systems that tells us a bit more. But what we're trying, what we're learning now is the different 
um, it effects uh, of climate change in different regions. So you know um, in coastal areas you expect flooding, you expect waterborne issues. In say, um, in the, say the Horn of Africa, you're expecting droughts and heat related um, um, issues. In the Pacific areas, you're also expecting um, waterborne diseases because of flooding and the rising sea levels. So as we're learning more about what climate change looks like in different areas, and we're learning more about what diseases and what patterns of disease and effects on the human body that we need to look out for. So there's no easy answer to your question, um, but as if we can build data systems that tell us more about what we're seeing, then it makes our responses a lot more sensitive to what we're seeing. Can I add super quickly too, um, Trish, this colleague I mentioned last night said, we also have to be thinking about adapting our operations when we're dealing with a great group of displaced people in a tent, it's 50 degrees out, there's no um, possibility for air conditioning, there's less fuel, like we have to, you know, put on this, this planning for 1.5, 2, 3, 4, that's, that's very real about, not only do we want to respond to people, whether urban, rural, but how are we going to do it in a warmer world? What? What I want to add is that uh, in our region, in Sahel region, we have also uh, terrorism, which affects a lot of people. And uh, the link is that in our areas, now we have draw in the areas, decision is not very good. There is food insecurity. Uh, vegetables are cut because the people need to have uh, energy. And the cause of terrorism, the refugee and the IDP make a lot of people come in these areas which are about now insecure. And this increase the risk of vegetable destruction and maybe they can increase the uh, effect of climate change because of the pressure of population in the areas uh, the people come to live. So it is a problem in uh, our north and south region now because of the pupil pressure on the natural, uh, it may affect the health of the people living in this area. So, okay. Okay, I've got, um, I've got two more questions, or maybe three more questions down the front here. I, I am looking at the back, so I'm, but I'm not seeing any hands going up. Um, who's got, we got, we got a microphone over here and then one, one down here. Should we start? Hello, um, my name is Panyan and I'm a gynecologist, so my question is going to Angela. I found it very interesting what you were um, saying about the impact on SRH, about multipara young mothers. Actually, these are problems we're facing since ages. So I, I'm wondering, first my questions towards advocacy. How are you putting together the dots of climate change and the problems we are facing since since ages, putting together and saying, yes, but it's getting worse because. Um, and then the second question is, you were, you were saying you're a retired humanitarian <laughs> and uh, you're doing development aid now. So my second question would be, beyond advocacy in development aid, what is the action you're taking in SRH and climate change putting together? Thanks. So the first question is one I was hoping nobody would ask because it's also something I struggle with. Um, some of the things we are seeing, you could say, have been happening for ages. Early marriage is not new in nomadic, I mean, nomadic communities. Um, vast distances because of undeveloped infrastructure and the increased risk of mortality because of um, poor access to care, not new. And again, it's the issue, it goes back to the issue of attribution. Is this getting, are we seeing a lot more of this because of climate change? Or is it because they've been there before and now that climate change becomes the confounder, we are seeing, we are now talking about it. I, I really have no answer to the question. But from qualitative, um, information coming from the communities themselves, they'll tell you this is different, this is, we're seeing a lot more um, issues. I mean, we, we, are, we are having to move farther and farther away from health facilities. We're having to 
Um, we're struggling to, say, breastfeed our kids because we have all these things that are going on. We are having to marry our girls off early because we need the livestock to take care of the ones that we have at the moment. But whether the SRH issues we're seeing are directly related to climate change, it's hard to tell. That link is really hard to tell. And until we can get data that allows us to make the link, it's really hard to tell. And to your second question um, around how we in development are doing more than just advocacy. So it's about building resi um, resilient climate, um, climate resilient health systems. So the, the ability of a health system to adapt and contract based on um, the, the disease patterns and the disease trends. And one example that's used by the nutrition folk is a surge model. So the ability to use data to see your increasing numbers of acute malnutrition, and then the system, a system-wide response. So you increase the number of health workers that you're sending to that area, you increase su supplies, you start prepping for what you anticipate to see. The other thing is around how we are starting to train health workers in sensitivity to climate change. So for instance, if you're counseling a woman on the importance of breastfeeding, but she's telling you, I have to spend eight hours away. So how do you change how you um, message and provide services in, in a situation like this? And also um, working with our humanitarian colleagues to think through the long term. So once you respond to a measles outbreak, what are we doing? to strengthen service provision, be it working with community health workers and embedding them into communities, to strengthen the system so that beyond the response, then you have um, ongoing service delivery. Do we have any other last comments from, from the panel? I'm afraid we are gonna have to wrap it up now. I'm sorry to those of you who couldn't get their question in. I just want to say what we learned from the access campaign and was um, one message, many voices. We're still getting it together in, in MSF, but I think this is a real opportunity for us that we learn from HIV. Like when there is a problem identified, we don't totally know the solution, but we say it's a problem and we, we roadmap together. So thanks. Anything else to add? Great. Well, Thank you very much for joining us in this session. If you could join me in thanking all our panelists, um, both in the room and, and the online. Now, next up, we have a lunch break. Um,